In this session, we are going to talk about reading lay summaries of scientific articles. A lay summary is an article that's directed towards the public as opposed to other academics or other doctors. And as such is usually more simplified so that it's understandable to people who don't have uh, an extensive scientific background. Sometimes these things are simplified to the point that they aren't actually correct. So we need to have the skills to be able to read these and understand where might these inconsistencies be. One of the ways that science uh, often comes into our lives in the form of lay summaries is regarding health fads. Um, whether it's a new diet or a new exercise regimen, there are always articles out there saying that this one is better, this one is newer, this one works better, you should try this one. And what we need to be able to do is read between the lines in these lay summaries to try to understand what was the actual science behind this, this summary. Uh, and thus, is it actually applicable to me? Do I believe it? Because often these lay summaries come with um, a bias on top of them. All articles come with some amount of bias. Scientists are uh, absolutely not immune from bias, but we need to be aware of what these biases might be. Health fads with little to no scientific background are nothing new. Um, in the past, we have had plenty of examples of health fads that were at best ineffective and at worst downright dangerous. Because these were not sufficiently researched, these products did a lot more harm than good. A few examples. Here, just about 100 years ago, uh, it was suggested that inserting radium samples into one's rectum would uh, combat impotence in men. We now know, of course, that radiation is dangerous and you absolutely would never want to put it inside your body anywhere. Lead paint used to be used as foundation to achieve the pale face that women in the Elizabethan era um, preferred. Coating your body in lead, also a terrible idea. And cough syrup in the 1800s frequently included a wide range of compounds that can be quite dangerous. Uh, this one including alcohol, cannabis, chloroform, and opioids. So back to the current day, uh, a case study. Um, this article here, uh, you can see the URL down here, from Stylist is talking about the Norwegian phenomenon known as friluftsliv, which means open air living. So read this article and think to yourself, what claim does it make? It's claiming that implementing the mindset of friluftsliv will improve your mental health. So let's think about some of the biases here. Does the author have an incentive to get you to read the article, to bring you in, uh, to give you a certain answer, to get you to click on more things? Well, websites make money per click. And if you have a more exciting headline, people are more likely to click on it. This is clickbait. What promises or what assumptions does this article make? It's assuming that you're currently unsatisfied with your life and it is claiming that this article has the key to your happiness. So it takes you down this path here, starting with free lifts live, talking about mental health, then into keto diets and then yoga, makeup tips, style hacks, and finally into suggested products. One thing to note is how many links there are in this, article, in this article to other articles on the Stylist website. Hot topics. Uh, frequently, articles will use hot topics to get your attention and bring you in. So some of the ones that are mentioned here, health, mental health. Uh, it's great that this is a hot topic, but uh, we, do need to, we do need to take a critical eye to articles that are claiming to talk about mental health. Scandinavia. There are lots of Scandinavian trends that are hot right now. Uh, this free Luftslev is um, perhaps in the same realm as the, uh, the Danish uh, um, phenomenon of Hige. And of course, talking about the pandemic and how to be healthier in the pandemic. One of the things to take a look at is what products are placed throughout the article. Are there products that you're encouraged to buy to uh, live this healthy lifestyle that they're talking about? And yes, there are. They suggest buying ra uh, rain boots, hiking boots, a rain jacket, and this might lead you to also buy some books on Scandinavian living. 
So the claim up front is implementing this mentality of free lift slip will improve your mental health. But the message behind this is you need to buy our products and click on our articles to successfully live this way. Ergo, buying our products and clicking on our articles will make you happy. So we can tell that while there is perhaps some science behind the article, here primarily they are using it as advertising. What, is, what about the study that this is actually reporting on? So here is a link to the article that they are talking about, which found that people who spend at least 120 minutes outside per week reported higher levels of well-being. Does this mean that being outdoors makes you happy? And I'm not saying that this is the, uh, the message that the actual scientific article found. This is just the lay summary, the interpretation, the public interpretation of this article. So here, one thing we need to talk about is correlation versus causation. Correlation is how closely linked two things are. Do they tend to happen together? Causation is one actually causing another one. So in this example here, we have one individual coming up saying, another huge study found no evidence that cell phones cause cancer. What was the WHO thinking? And the person with the hat says, well, no, they got it backward. Looking at this graph here of total cancer incidents and cell phone users, they have concluded that cancer causes cell phones. Obviously, this is silly. This is an example uh, where we're talking about correlation versus causation. So bringing this back to the article, about being outside, time outside and well being may be related, but it doesn't mean that one directly necessarily causes the other. There are other confounding variables that may be the real cause of the extra happiness. For instance, people who are able to spend a lot of time outside might generally be healthier. They might live in a nicer neighborhood with better access to outdoor space that is pleasant. They might work fewer hours. They might have more friends or family or pets that they can spend time outdoors with. And they might not have certain stressful life events going on, such as a move, a divorce, or having a sick family member that would take away from their time being outside. So these are all uh, variables that could be related to, that are most likely related to happiness and could also be related to being outside. It doesn't mean that being outside and happiness are directly related to each other. So now take a moment to think about other possible confounding variables that you can think of that might be more directly related to happiness or more directly related to being outside. Continuing to talk about confounding variables, let's say you find that people who own VCRs are more likely to have heart failure. Does this mean that VCRs cause heart failure? Well, think about some variables that could influence your data. The most important one being age. Um, in this day and age, older people are almost definitely the ones who own a VCR. And they are, of course, also the ones who are more likely to have heart issues. So how do we account for confounding variables in scientific studies? And this is something that we'll go into a lot more detail in the research design section of the course. But just a few examples. One way that we can do this is restriction. So only using a subset of subjects, only using subjects in the study that are, are the same demographic, such as 30 to 50 year old men who don't smoke. We might match subjects. So this would be comparing similar subjects so that the only difference between them is the variable that you're interested in, comparing one woman of a certain age to another woman of the same age, for example. And randomization. Um, for studies where you are implementing some intervention, sorting participants randomly into groups will control for differences between the individuals if the groups are large enough. If the sorting into groups is not random, it might be that there is some underlying characteristic of your groups that is actually causing the difference that you're seeing as opposed to the variable that you're interested in. So let's say that you are doing a study to see if a vitamin supplement promotes weight loss. How can you make sure that any of the weight fluctuations that you actually see in the study are due to the vitamin pill and not something else, such as age, gender, or fitness level? One option is to use restriction. So for example, only selecting participants that exercise regularly. You could use matching, comparing participants within the same age group. 
and you can use randomization. So randomly sorting participants into one group that receives the vitamin pill that you're interested in and another group that receives a placebo or a fake pill. Um, the placebo effect is a real effect that we'll talk about more later in this course, but just the act of being in a study can often affect people's behavior. So it is important that you have a placebo control to say that the, the intervention that you're testing is actually the one that's causing whatever outcome you see, as opposed to just the effect of being in a study. And now just some fun examples of correlation not equaling causation. These come from this uh, great website that has a long list of what we call spurious correlations. Um, and just a couple examples here. So in this example here, we have the number of people who drowned by falling, in, falling into a pool between the years of 1999 and 2009. And in black, we have the number of films that Nicolas Cage appear, appeared in. Well, those do seem to track together, don't they? Do we actually think that Nicolas Cage appearing in films leads to people drowning in pools? No. Another example, per capita cheese consumption in red between the years 2000 and 2009, and the number of people who die by becoming tangled in their bedsheets in black. This is a really strong correlation. Also, totally spurious. There is no scientific reason to think that cheese consumption would lead to people getting tangled in their bed sheets and dying. So there are plenty of other um, funny examples on this website that you can go check out. Um, just driving home this, um, this point that just because two variables happen to co-occur doesn't mean that they are connected. And this is one of the things that we um, one of the central pieces of how we set up studies is making sure that we are looking at true correlations as opposed to random things that happen to co-occur.